Now in this video I'd like to update you on what's been learned from Kepler and Kepler succession missions as of 2020 when I'm filming this. Um, my apologies for the different waistcoat. I'm doing this under COVID-19 lockdown and my waistcoat is currently locked in my office which I can't get to so I have to wear a different waistcoat. Anyway, um, we've talked quite a bit about the results from Kepler. Kepler finally was turned off in 2018 and for several years before that he'd been running with only a limited uh, number of reaction wheels so that he'd been able to only look for short periods of time at different areas of the sky. But we've now been able to analyse and think about the data and also follow up observations. I'll explain some of that and also what's going to come after Kepler, in fact has already come at the time of filming this. So. How frequent are planets? Well, this graph shows distance from the star and the occurrence rates of planets, different types of stars. So M stars are the real red dwarfs, and they're getting hotter and hotter to G-type stars like our sun, F stars, which are massive and hotter and younger than our sun. What you can see is that they're all rarer at very, very close distances, like 0.01 astronomical units, and they become more and more frequent until they get up to about 0.1 astronomical units, and then it seems, as far as you can tell, to be pretty flat beyond there. And uh, Kepler can't really probe anything much further out than that. Also, you can see that at the same radius, planets seem to be more common around the cool stars, the red dwarfs, than the hot stars. This is a log scale, so it's about a factor of 10. So it seems planets are rarer closer in, more common further out, and that's the opposite of what's always been seen, because when you look at the data, you always tend to see the ones closer in, but this is taking out the effect of the biases in our samples. And it seems that the small, cold, dwarfy red stars have more planets than the big, bright, powerful blue stars. Well, very interesting. Somewhat puzzling, or maybe not, is looking at the your period of the planet against the planet's size. Remember, this is transit data, so you're able to work out the radius of the planet by seeing what fraction of the light of the star it blocks out. You don't know the mass, but you do know the radius. What you can kind of see is there's a gap in the middle here. There's a clump of stars down here, at, uh, or planets I mean, going from sort of 0.5 up to about 1.5 Earth radii, and then there's a whole bunch bigger, but there's a gap in the middle. There are a few planets in the middle, but by and large it seems that planets break in half. There's a population of small ones, of 1.7 Earth radii and down, and then there's a population of big ones, which is uh, you know, 2 Earth radii and up, and there are not very many in between. And that, seems, that dip seems now to be real. For a long time, people speculated that the dip was there, and there were actually these two separate populations. But now, it has got much better, not actually because of Kepler, it's because of other telescopes and missions which have allowed more accurate measurement of the properties of the stars. What we can see is there do seem to be two populations. And it's tempting to think that these two populations are caused by whether it's a rocky planet or a gassy planet. The idea is that all planets probably started off with a fair bit of gas, and they get close in, they get a lot of heat dumped on it, and in the small planets the gravity isn't enough to hold the gas there, and the gas blows away, leaving just a rocky core without much gas. And these would be the Earth-like planets, or even Venus-like planets. I mean, you think of Venus as being a very thick atmosphere, but still it's a very, very small fraction of the total mass. And then the bigger ones, so these would be like the super-Earths, and these would be the sub-Neptunes, if you like. These ones which are, have just enough mass to be able to hold their gas. And so that's why they're so much more massive, because they've got all the gas mass in them. So these are like, probably look more like a small version of Neptune rather than a big version of Earth or Venus. And that might explain why the small ones are mostly down here at short periods, and the big ones are at longer periods, because they're exposed to less light. 
That's a good theory, it's not necessarily true, but it seems there is the gap, and that's the obvious explanation. So you can use that boundary to work out whether something is likely to be mostly rocky with some sort of atmosphere around it, or a very gassy sort of planet. More puzzling is the correlation between the metallicity of the star, which is how many heavy elements. Now remember, for an astronomer, a heavy element is everything other than hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium came out of the Big Bang. Everything else has to be through a star at some point. And you might have stars, depending on how much the gas that made the star, would have been through a certain number of other stars before. And the more previous stars that gas has been through, so you might get primordial gas from the Milky from the Big Bang, collapses, forms a first generation star, in the middle heavy elements have created, exploded out, that then merges to form a second generation star, more heavy elements produced, exploded out, and as time goes on you get more and more generations, you get more and more heavy elements. So this is the value of the Sun, this will be log 0.4 more, so these ones are more heavy elements, they probably been through the gas that made them up to be through more stars and now the less. And you might expect that if stars have more heavy elements, they might have more rocky planets, because rocky planets are made of heavy elements, there's more elements to make it. But you have to bear in mind that the, uh, the amount of mass in the rocks, is, or in the planets, is kind of a rounding error on what's actually in the star, because planets are so small compared to their stars. What you can see is that for planets very close to the sun, the periods of 1 to 10 days, or Jupiter's if you like, or the Earth-like things around small stars, um, you can see the different sizes of planets. There is a tendency for them to be more common when the star has more heavy elements. But for the really small ones, the super-Earths, it's the smallest you can see, they're still pretty big planets. There's not much of a trend, whereas if you get to bigger and bigger ones like Jupiter's and sub Saturn's, there's a very big trend. Definitely see more of those in these stars with lots of heavy elements. When you go further out, here it's 10 to 100 days, which of course is still very close to the star, it becomes a bit more confusing. There's actually no clear, obvious trend. Some things go up, some things go down. At this point, I don't think anyone has any idea what this is telling us. It's telling us something, I'm sure, but what? We have no idea. So that's kind of where we're at from Kepler, now having had a couple of years since it stopped working in 2018 to think about it. It looks like planets are very common, most common around low mass stars, most not that common close in. Of course we still can't see with Kepler things much further out. Where now? Well Kepler's replacement is called TESS and this has been up for over a year now. It's different from Kepler because it surveys a much wider area of the sky, but has got a um, doesn't go as deep, doesn't see such faint stars. And what that means is, for Kepler, it looked at one small region of the sky, and because it was sensitive to very faint stars, the average star it was seeing was quite a long way away, several so thousands of light years. Whereas TESS, because it's got a much wider field of view, can look at over its mission, pretty much the whole sky, 85% of the sky. But because it's only seeing very bright ones, it can't see things that are very far away. So it's looking at our own solar neighborhood. And that's kind of deliberate. Um, if we see a cool transiting thing with Kepler, A, we're never going to be able to go there, at least not for a very long time. And if you want to follow it up, for example, to measure the radial velocity to get the mass, it's hard because the stars are faint. And radial velocity observations, even with the world's biggest telescopes, take a long time on faint stars. Whereas the stars you're going to see with TESS are going to be much brighter, so it's much easier to do follow-up observations, to um, look for transit spectroscopy, to do radial velocity measurements. And the stars are nearby, nearby being within a few hundred light years typically, um, which means they might actually be things that in some future science fiction where we could actually go and visit. Here's the pattern. Um, it surveys different parts of the sky with its wide field of view and regions near its orbital pole. It observes for about a year. Most of the sky it only observes for 27 days. So that's again different from Kepler. The point of Kepler was to look for Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars, and given they have a period of one year. For example, of our own Earth-like planet around our own Sun-like star, it takes one year to go around. So they needed to observe for over a year, probably several years, at the same part of the sky to see these very rare repeating transits. But it seems they're not attempting that really. They might just about luck out 
in this polar region. But most of the time, they're only going to observe in 27 days, which means they're only going to see planets that are very close in. However, a large majority of the very close stars to us are red dwarf stars, and if you want to plant in a habitable zone of a red dwarf, it's going to be going around very, very fast. Red dwarfs are some pathetically weak, miserable little stars that you have to be very, very close to actually be in a habitable zone. So that's TESS, which is underway at the moment. Um, it's already finding exoplanets, but it's too early to really have much statistics about what it's seeing, but that will be coming out at time for our next update of this course, I'm sure. Further out, the European Space Agency has its Plato spacecraft mission, which is, in a sense, more like Kepler. It's going to look at one particular region of the sky for a longer time, and it's going to be focused more at finding if there are planets around sun-like stars. And to do that, it has to look further out, but it still has a much wider field of view and higher precision than Kepler. But that's still you know, five or six years away at the least. But it should be very exciting. 